Welcome to the YB Min Monthly Lecture Series, offered by the Center for Asian Business at Loyola Marymount University and funded by a grant from the International Communication Foundation of Seoul, Korea. I'm just going to make this a very informal process. I'm not here to really lecture. I just want to kind of talk to you about the movie industry. I'm sure you guys are, are I, I haven't met one person that's not interested in watching movies. So what, what's the last movie you guys have seen recently? Anybody? Harry I'm sorry? Harry Potter. Harry Potter, okay, not our movie. <laughs> anyone else? Did anyone else uh, see a Paramount movie recently? No? Extra credit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that actually kind of proves what I want to talk about. Um, the movie industry is very, very unique. It's, first of all, how many business students here? Okay, how many film students? Okay, we have more business people than, than film students. All right, then you guys know the notion of marketing, you guys know the notion of branding. Um, I have a PhD in business and marketing, so I, I tend to approach things from the marketing perspective uh, when I do my job. Uh, the thing about movie industry, which is very interesting and very challenging, is that unlike any other industry, like for instance, if you go to Best Buy to buy a computer, for instance, um, it's, a, it's a purchase that you can, you can touch, you can use, you can actually try it. If you don't like it, you can come back and get a refund, correct? Whereas a movie is experiential. You can't really touch it. You have to feel it, right? And typically, there are no refunds. So you can't just try and say, well, you know, didn't like that. Well, some people do. You, do you guys ever get, go out and say, that was two hours. I will never get back. I want my money back. Do you guys ever do that? You do? OK. Well, just don't do it for a Paramount movie. Um, it's, it's very rare that you would go and say, you know, that really sucked. I want my money back. Um, we don't do that. Now, another really interesting thing about the movie industry is that your failure success rate is very, very difficult to predict. So if you have a new, if you're launching a new product, let's say you're launching a new computer, you can pretty much do a, a product life cycle and say, you know what, in about one year we're going to, we project we're going to sell these number of units, in two years we might break even, and this is where I'm going to get all my money back. Well, in a movie industry, that's very, very difficult to do, right? Um, for instance, uh, Gosh, I always talk about this one, but do you guys remember the movie Collateral, not Collateral, um, The Island? We had Ewan McGregor and, and Scarlett Johansson was in it. It was a Michael Bay directed movie. Well, it was supposed to be a huge blockbuster, obviously, because Michael Bay is a big director. Well, it didn't do so well. Uh, unfortunately, it actually flopped. Uh, for something like that, you really don't, can't predict you know, how much it's going to do until it actually opens. So it's one industry where you can lose $100 million in one week, or you can make $100 million in three days or two days or whatever. Uh, it's a very dynamic, dynamic uh, industry where you can't really quite predict the success of it. And the reason why I asked you guys whether you've seen a Paramount movie is this concept of brand is very unclear, OK? You guys, if, uh, you guys are business people, so you know what branding is, right? Companies spend millions of dollars trying to brand their company. Well, in the movie industry, we don't do that, right? So let's say Lord of the Rings. You guys all know Lord of the Rings. Who made Lord of the Rings? What studio? See, it's not clear, right? It was New Line. How about Spider-Man? Sony, okay, Sony. But not a lot of people know that because we don't brand our company. We don't say uh, Paramount Pictures Presents. We don't really brand it as much. And why is that? Why do we not brand our products or, or our company, the brand, the studio itself? Anybody? Because, our, like I said, our success rate is so volatile 
we don't want to brand it with a, with a picture that might flop one time and then we might have a big success. And it's, it's such a, a volatile industry that we don't want to brand it. And actually, every single movie has a different brand, right? Its own brand. So for each movie, we have to sit down and strategize and say, OK, what's going to be our brand for this movie? Uh, if you guys, I'm sure you've seen Transformers. OK, that just came out. Um, Transformers, what's the brand in that movie? Transformers. What is our, our brand that we want to push for you to go over there and, and buy that ticket? Well, if it's a Steven Spielberg movie, usually Spielberg, our director, is our brand. If we have Tom Cruise in it, Tom Cruise is our brand. Go ahead. Michael Bay is our brand, sure. Do we have any big stars in the movie? Not really. Shia LaBeouf, I mean, you know, not a big movie star. Megan Fox. Megan Fox, too, maybe guys. You know, that might be a brand. Um, sure, she became a brand. Go ahead. Exactly. It's the, the, it's the toys. It's, it's the Megatron. It's the Optimus Prime that um, is our brand. So we were pushing, actually, the, the toy itself rather than a movie star. And that changes for each movie, correct? So that's make, it makes it a, a little bit more interesting and very dynamic. Now, like I said, opening weekend is key these days because now with Twitter and Facebook, we can't really wing it anymore. I mean, word of mouth is so immediate that as soon as the movie opens, we used to have at least like a, maybe a one-week window where you know, it takes about a week for you to figure out how bad the movie is, if it's bad, right? Um, but these days, we don't even get three days. We don't even get Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We might get Friday because people are in there watching a movie and texting their friends. Don't even you know, waste your time on this movie. So they might be in line to get the ticket, and they might buy something else. So a word of mouth effect is so immediate these days that it's very, very difficult to market. The way we market movies these days um, has changed dramatically since, uh, uh, since the you know, internet and, and texting. So the opening weekend is key. Do you guys remember in 1994, this is a while ago, what movie had the biggest opening weekend in 1994? Forrest Gump? Actually, it was Interview with the Vampire. And this was the biggest opening of that year, $37 million. You know, it's respectable. But now we're talking $158 million just for the first weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday alone. And this is only US, by the way. This is do domestic. Of course, if you put in international, it's a lot more than that. Um, so the reason I say this is because our window of our, our revenue is so, so, so small, and it has shrunk so much that, that the way we distribute our content has to change, because we need to now come up with additional revenue resources, right? Uh, revenue streams. So trends in the movie market, I know we're talking, supposed to talk about the Korean wave, but I'm just kind of talking about the, the movie industry itself a little bit first. Uh, the trend in the, uh, the movie industry now is that we have multiple distribution channels because we can't just rely on theatrical anymore because our revenue is just those three days, right? So now we have, in, in addition to theatrical, we have DVD, of course. That's always been there. We have video on demand. We have IPTV, mobile TV. Uh, of course, we have downloads, legal and illegal. Um, some of them are on YouTube. Um, and it makes things a lot more difficult now. And because of piracy, because of uh, downloading, you know, mostly illegal these days, if you down, you know, some of us pay money on, on uh, iTunes, and hopefully we all do, but a lot of us still don't. For some reason these days, kids think that if it's on the internet, it's free, right? So it's costing us a lot of money. And why is it costing us a lot of money? Because now our window is shrinking. And what I mean by window is the time between when it opens in theaters and it comes out on DVD, that window is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. right? So we used to be able to put our DVD date six months 
after the release in theaters, but now it's like three months, right? And another thing is, because of piracy, now we have to open worldwide day and date, all at the same time. We used to be able to just uh, open in US, see how it goes, okay, test market, and then we go to Europe maybe two months later, we go to Asia two months later, and, but now we don't have that luxury. We actually have to open worldwide on the same day, same date. Okay, and why is that a problem for us? Day and date release, what's the problem? If we do that, it costs us a lot of money. Why would it cost us money? If we go day and date worldwide as opposed to going here and then going somewhere else two months later, going somewhere else two months later. Anybody? Go ahead. It's a much bigger loss because you're, you're distributing in other theaters. Uh huh. Versus if you just start small and then go big, you're going big already, so if you lose out, that's really true. And I think what you're trying to say is that we're actually, we have to make all the prints, right? So if we're opening here, we can reuse those prints and use it in Asia later on, use it in Europe later. But now, because we have to go day and date, we actually have to make tens of thousands of prints as opposed to thousands of prints. So it's costing us millions of dollars. What's another reason why it's a problem? It has to do with marketing. Publicity. Publicity is very difficult because we can't fly Tom Cruise to 10 different countries on, on the same day, right? So we can't quite market our movies effectively because we have to go day and day. Right, so it makes it very, very difficult for us. Um, so trends in the movie industry, now we're going global. Okay, so because our window is shrinking, we have to say, all right, we need to go global because we're opening globally day and date anyway. So what do we need to do to make our movies a little bit more global friendly? Okay, so it'll be, uh, play, uh, it'll be profitable all over the world. And that's something that we always think about these days. And why we have to go global is because this is sort of the, the chain, the process of when a movie opens, it opens in the box office, this is in theaters, and then it goes to DVD. Uh, but then between that, we have pay-per-view, and then it goes to premium cable, pay-per-view, VOD, broadcast TV, and finally basic cable. So this is sort of the process. Now, when we do our profit, P&L we call it, right, profits and losses, we actually do a 10-year P&L. So in a movie, when we say, okay, is this movie profitable, we look at it at a, on a 10-year cycle. So right now, in theaters, it may not be making money, but at the end of the day, in 10 years, this movie will make money. That's the way we look at it, right? So box office is only the very, very beginning of this chain, but it's the most important one because that drives everything else. If it doesn't do well at the box office, we're not going to get the good deals for the DVDs, we're not going to get the good deals for the TV, and we're not going to get our profits, right? So most of the time, just in theaters, it's a losing, it's a, a, um, losing proposition. Typically, when we have a movie, we may spend 50% of our budget, 50% of our production budget, on marketing it. So if the movie costs $100 million, we may spend an, a, another $50 million just to market it. And it's, and it's not the s same ratio, but just roughly speaking, you can think that you know, we spend a lot of money on marketing, right? And the revenue pie kind of looks like this these days. So the box office is only about 28% of the whole pie. This is the revenue pie. And then the DVD and the rest is TV, right? And what does that really tell us? It means that consumers now prefer to watch at their own leisure. So kids these days, when they're growing up, they're so multitasking that they can't just sit in one place in a theater for two hours and do nothing. They have to be texting, they have to be chatting, they have to be doing all these other things all at once. They would rather stay at home, not rather, but um, they would like to be able to see whatever they want, whenever they want. And that's the way we should distribute our, our content now. So when you guys are thinking about uh, when you graduate and you go out and do your own things, think about that. You should think about what consumers want these days. These days, consumers want flexibility options, right? And so it changes the way we do our business as well. 
So sort of the industry rule of thumb is that your domestic box office revenue should cover the, the production cost. So let's say the movie costs $200 million to make, then we really should make $200 million from the U, from US alone to cover that. Because international profits will cover the marketing cost. Okay? And everything else beyond that hopefully will be profit. If we don't make that, it's going to be a negative. Uh, oftentimes, we lose money on a lot of our movies. Right? It's not uh, the ratio, again, you know, it's a hit and miss. Not all of our movies are profitable. And if we don't get to this point, almost always, well, I shouldn't say almost always, it's more likely that we will lose money if we don't get to this stage than if we only do <coughs> theatrical, right? Okay. Um, this is sort of the, the, I guess, the history of the internet where it's going. In the 90s, we were just happy to receive information on the internet, right? And, and by 2000, there was so much information that we had to have these, uh, we call it the hunt mode. You know, we have these uh, search engines now that did all that search engines for us. Now, it's very uh, interactive. It's now Facebook, Twitter, it's very, very interactive, okay? And actually, with a w what we've seen these days is that if we give uh, consumers the option to participate, so if we allow you guys to watch, let's say, clips of the movie, and we say, why don't you guys tell us what the ending should be like? Do you like this scene? Do you like that scene? And you guys write to us and say, you know, if I'm directing this movie, I would do it a little bit differently. I might want to have this kind of ending as opposed to that kind of ending. When we give our viewers that kind of, that, that, uh, the ability to participate, they feel like they, they belong. They feel like they're part of this movie. And they're a lot more likely to go out and, and tell good word of mouth to their friends. Right? It's very interactive these days. So online marketing is huge. We, um, we don't quite use newspaper advertising anymore because who reads the newspapers anymore? I don't. I always read everything on the internet now. So we are sort of shifting things along. Now, and I keep saying global because our window is shrinking. Our domestic box office is not enough to uh, make money on our movies. So we have to go global. Now, when we go global, what are some of these issues? We have to make sure that this movie is appealing to, say, someone in Asia, someone in Europe, right? So we want to make sure that we strategize going forward, even before the movie starts. In pre-production, we have to think about that. Is this movie something that we can sell globally, right? But there are some issues um, when you're doing global, of course. and then. Uh, I, I cover North America, but of course I'm interested in, in the Asian industry um, and this Korean wave. Have you guys heard of the term Korean wave, by the way? See, that's the thing. That's the problem. We have this thing called Korean wave. Koreans and Korean and Asians think that uh, their actors, their, their movies are all over the world. They think that everybody knows who this actor is, who that actor is, and they call it the Korean wave and they make such a big deal out of it. Well, in Hollywood, hardly anyone knows, right? If, if I ask you, can you name one Asian actor? Can you guys name one? Jackie Chan, okay. <laughs> Jackie Chan. <laughs> Jackie Chan, he's Chinese. Can you guys think of a Korean actor? Yeah. That's the thing. Is it, but then they're so, I shouldn't say delusional, but um, I think they do make it to be bigger than it, it actually is. But there is some merit to it. Okay, there is something called the Korean wave that's going all over Asia. Maybe not so much in Hollywood in America, but in Asia, Korean wave really does exist, and it actually is, it has some force. Okay, so Hollywood and Asia. Um, there were some really good stuff that came out of Asia uh, lately, maybe in the past seven years or so. Um, 
Do you guys know this movie called Old Boy? Okay, some of the film students might know because I hear that they actually use that as part of their curriculum. Um, it's a very edgy, very controversial movie that came out a while ago, maybe seven years ago. Um, rather violent, you know, for my taste, but um, it's, it was, cons it, it actually won, I believe, one of the top uh, awards at the Cannes Film Festival uh, about seven years ago. And that sort of, uh, um, that was a catalyst for this whole Korean wave to start. And it's really there, but like I said, America doesn't really know. How about Ring? Have you guys seen The Ring? Scary, right? Really scary. That was also a remake of a Japanese movie called Ringu. And that did very well for us. Um, this is a, a very current marketing question. Paranormal. Who has, anyone, do you guys know what Paranormal is? Have you guys heard of it? Okay. It's our movie. And it's actually, it's been open maybe about a week, but it's only been playing at midnight on certain theaters. <laughs> and uh, it's very, very scary. I can't watch it. I have a thing against horror movies, so whenever we, we launch a horror movie, I have a pass. I can't watch it, <laughs> or I can't sleep at night. And we have something called Paranormal coming out. It's going to go wide uh, this Friday and again next Friday as well. So I'm sure you guys will see it in, in a few days, what it's like. But it's a very, very scary movie. Um, so Asia it has been trying really hard to go global. But is it always good to go global? I mean, it's not always good to. I mean, you. Your movie could survive just as well in your own country and still be very successful. You don't have to go global to be successful, but I think a lot of people think that if you don't go global that you are not a success, which I disagree. Uh, so what works? What works? Um, there are certain types of movies that actually work better than others. If you are a filmmaker, and so we have some film students here, if you were doing a remake, what would actually work well? What would transfer well globally? What kind of movie, what genre works? Comedy. Would comedy work well? What's your name? Ryan. Ryan, okay. I'd say action. Action, okay, action's good. Action's good. Comedy is very cultural, so it's very difficult to do a remake or um, even a, a redistribution. If we bring over a movie that's very successful in Asia and we bring it over here, I mean, the, the sensibilities are different and we don't find it so funny, right? So comedies are a bit difficult. What, what other genre works? Cartoon. Cartoon. Cartoon, okay. Cartoon works okay, right? Love story. Love story, horror. Horrors, good. Anything that elicits very basic emotions like fear, things like that, tends to work well because they, they translate. It, it doesn't matter what language it's in, it translates well, whereas comedy doesn't quite translate very well. Okay. Um, and this is kind of interesting. This is sort of the, the, the ratings revenue pie here in America. So as you can see, PG-13 makes up most of our box office revenue. Okay, and rated R only is about 10% of that. PG is 23, G is a little bit smaller. So this is where we want to be. And what we try to do, and we have a movie that's rated R, we try <laughs> really hard to try to make it to PG-13 because that expands our market. Okay, that really does double, triple our potential market. So. You know, oftentimes it might get rated R for certain language, like F words, then we, we try to take that out. Unless it's a movie specifically for that audience where it needs that rated R movie or, or, or tagged to it, right? But we try to make it so that it's rated PG. Well, in Korea, most of the movies are right here. Very R rated oriented. And like Old Boy, the, the, for those of you guys who have seen it, I think that could have been an NC-17 because it was so violent, 
right? And that's the kind of movies that they make, and they try to bring it over here, and they, they keep thinking, well, it's not working so well. Well, it's because the market is different, okay? In Korea, unfortunately, kids are just really busy studying all day. And they go to school, they I mean, literally, little kids, like fourth graders, come home at 10, at 10 p.m., I think. All day long, they're in school, they're doing something, they're tutoring. It's so sad to see kids just, you know, st studying all day long. But that's why it doesn't work over there. Now, if they want to go global, they really need to strategize what kind of movie works in America, what kind of movie works uh, elsewhere, right? Okay, so this is the part where this, it's called Hallyu, that's the Korean wave. And what that means is, literally, it means a new term in Asian countries, meaning in fashion of Korean content such as games, drama, movie, and entertainers among youngsters. It's called Hallyu. Okay. And do you guys know who this guy is? Rain. Rain. Well, Asians might know. He's a very, very famous pop star, singer, actor. He does everything. Okay, and he was in Speed Racer. Speed Racer didn't do so well, obviously, but he's a huge star in Korea, and now he's, he's coming over here. And that's part of the whole Korean wave, is trying to push Korean actors and content to Hollywood and elsewhere. It doesn't have to be Hollywood, it could be Asia. It really is meant for Asia, but now they're trying to come in and penetrate the U.S. market, which is a lot more difficult. Do you guys know what this guy is? Any online gamers here? Okay. Well, this is like one of the top, top rated online games in Korea. Uh, what's interesting is in Korea, most of the kids are playing internet online games. They don't play console games. Whereas in America, most of us are, uh, are playing, what is it, uh, PlayStation and Xbox and so forth, right? And it's, it's a different culture. And it's interesting that online games tend not to do so well here. Who, how many of you guys play online games? Yeah? Okay. And you play with other people you don't know online, right? And you're chatting and you're doing all that. Well, in Korea, there are instances where kids, they have what's called PC cafe. And it's a place where you just you have a bunch of PCs and you play games all day. And kids don't go home, they just play, play ga uh, games, or not even kids, even adults. They go there and play games for days on end, just eating some noodles. And then it, some, some people even died there, I think. It was a big news. <laughs> because they were playing games all day, not sleeping for like a week, two weeks straight, eating junk food. And one person actually died. Uh, it made big news. But anyway, so my point being is that the cult culture is so different that when we say, let's go, I mean, Korean wave, you really need to think about that before you do it. Um, and let's see, oops. This girl here, this was a period piece, but this is a Korean TV drama that was hugely successful in Korea. And then it was very successful all over Asia. So if she goes to Vietnam, she goes to Taiwan, she goes to China or, or Tokyo or what, wherever, she's a huge star. Of course, no one knows who she is here, right? But she's a huge star in Korea. And so this whole Korean wave thing is happening. But I don't, I'm Korean American, uh, but. I see things from a slightly different perspective. I don't really think that this is all that. I mean, it's, it's a bit of a hype, and I think that they need to understand that. Okay, and a second, again, Korean wave. This is G.I. Joe that just opened recently. Well, that was one of our movies. And he was one of the characters. He's, he's a Korean actor that we, we cast because he's huge in Asia, um, and especially in Japan and in Korea, and, and we thought that that would boost our box office in Asia, so we actually cast him. Uh, Speed Racer, again, had rain in it, and Wolverine had this guy named D Daniel Henney who played a, a, a bad agent 
in the movie. Um, so I talk to my Korean actor friends and they all want to come to America. They think this whole Korean wave thing is huge in Hollywood and everybody wants to use them in our, in, in, in our films. Well, not so much, you know, not so much. And I keep telling them, I think you're delusional. First of all, you have to speak English perfectly unless you're a, a, a kung fu star. Okay, maybe if you, if you have some kind of an edge and if you're Jackie Chan and Jet Li, maybe you can get away with it. But if you're a, a method actor, if you're, if you're an actor for the sake of acting, you really need to speak English perfectly. And they can't do that. So that's a challenge, right? And for, for, um, for singers, it's also very difficult because it, now they're trying to get into mainstream as, as, as a, a, an Asian. It, whereas in the movie, you have different characters and you can play an Asian character. But in the movie industry, you can't play an Asian singer. You're just a singer, right? So it's, it's doubly difficult, I think, in the music industry for a singer to come to, to America and try to penetrate it, right? So these guys actually have been quite successful, and he, actually, he helped our box office in, in, in Asia. So um, he dies in the movie. Well, supposedly, he falls into, uh, have you guys seen G.I. Joe by any chance? OK. The guy actually, I'm sorry, did, did I blow it for some people? OK. All right. Um, but we're, you know, we're contemplating, do we, do we bring him back to our sequel? You know, he was so good to us in terms of our box office, you know, all kinds of fun things going on. Um, Korean wave technology, I think this is also a very important point, is that, that Korea is, is probably uh, the, the most technologically advanced countries in the world. And it's a very good test bed, uh, meaning it has the highest internet access penetration in the world. Okay, huge number of internet users, uh, mobile phones. If you're breathing, you have a mobile phone. You have a cell phone in Korea if you're breathing. Um, even if you're three years old, I think you have a cell phone. <laughs> and, and they can text, like my nephew, crazy. My nephew could, uh, he's like a teenager, and he lives in Korea, and he could text using his fingers while it's in his pocket. I'm like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm texting my friend. And he's like doing this, and he, I don't know how he does it, and that's how kids, kids live. And they, they text each other even though they're sitting right next to each other. Like, I, it was really funny. I was in a, ca a cab with my nephew and his friend. The three of us were in a cab, and they're texting each other while they're sitting right next to each other. I said, is it because you don't want me to hear something? I said, no. We just, you know, sometimes we actually, we can say things more freely via text than actually verbally. And I thought, that's very, very strange. <laughs> very strange. But they say, and then I thought about that. I said, you know, email has that kind of an effect. I think there was a Wall Street Journal, um, or was it LA Times or New York Times, um, article not too long ago about how Facebook is creating these Friends, friends become, I guess you could become closer through Facebook, but you, ca you guys could actually hate each other and get really frustrated and get on your nerves. Because who really cares that you're, you're at 2 o'clock in the morning, you're eating some, some soup? <laughs> like, I don't really need to know that. And, and, you know, I just had the best Peking duck in, in my entire life. Like, who the heck cares, you know? Um, I don't really need to know all the intricacies of your life. You know, what you're doing with your boyfriend, I don't need to know. Uh, but I think that, that pop culture is changing in a way that communication is changing, right? Not only is the content changing, but the way we communicate is changing. And, and if you have, if you're a lot more comfortable texting than talking, you know, I think it's not a problem, it's just different. 
the way kids communicate these days is different, right? And we need to be aware of that. And when we do business, when you guys go off and do your own business, you need to think about that. How, how do we stay one step ahead of what consumers like and what they will do in five years and 10 years, okay? Because it, things are changing, very, very different. Um, and uh, Korean Wave does seem to work in Korea because it used to be, the industry used to be what, steel, used to be agriculture. Now it's content and government is supporting that. They're giving uh, lots of uh, incentives and grants for, for companies that are content oriented. So it is happening, it's a real thing. Um, and it's been growing so much. I mean, I mean content, move, the movie industry was almost non-existent say 15 years ago in Korea. Now, the movie industry is huge, okay? And what's happening? It's because this is whole Korean wave thing. They think that it's so cool to become a movie star. If, if you ask kids, um, I hear that more than 50% of the kids, if you ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's no longer I want to be the president. It's usually I want to be an actress, I want to be a singer, I want to be an actor, or I want to uh, work in, the, in a game company. Those are the four most desirable uh, uh, occupations when you ask little kids, right? So content is a huge <coughs> thing in, in Korea. And, and another thing is, it's very recession proof. When things are not going well economically, um, people tend to go to the movies. Maybe you don't spend a lot of money on big ticket items, but you still go to the movies. Right? So when the economy is bad, the movie industry actually thrives. So it's not that I want the economy to be bad, but it actually helps us. Uh, it's a very interesting industry. Now, um, I wanted to show you some of these things, these graphs. Since we're just talking about the Korean wave, I'm, I'm looking at the Korean market only. Um, a very sharp increase in Korean films. So as you can see, like in 2001, they only had, uh, let's see, the, the blue is number of Korean films released, okay? In 1999, less than 50 movies, Korean movies were released. Now, in 2006, at the peak, okay, they had um, over 100 Korean films released in Korea, okay? And then foreign films released in um, Korea as well. So in total, they had almost 400 movies released last year or, or in, in the year of 2007 in Korea. Now this is a problem, okay? Why is that a problem? Because, well, first of all, let me show you this. It's a problem because um, in 2008, 62% of titles as, uh, were released in Korea as they were released in the U.S. What I mean by that is, let's see, uh, 2008, okay. 2008, the red represents the number of movies released here in the United States, okay. So in 2008, we had over 600 movies released here in one year. In Korea alone, almost 400 movies were released in Korea. Now, what's wrong with that picture? Okay, 600 in U.S. versus almost 400 in Korea. What's the population of Korea versus the population of U.S.? Population of U.S. is how much? Roughly 300 million people. In Korea, there's roughly 50 million people, which is about I don't know, 15, 16 percent of the population in the U.S. Does that, I mean, do you see that that's just too many movies being released? They don't have to, they don't have enough people to watch all those movies, <laughs> right? Even if you go watch a movie a day, you know, it's not, it's not enough. So obviously the movie industry has been declining. It used to go up because they did not have enough movies, but now they made too many movies. If you own a, a, uh, a movie company, from what I understand, most of their films have been a negative. They've been losing money on most of their films. 
Okay, it's not a good place to be. So I said, if I have my own money, I wouldn't put it in a movie. Um, I would put it in a company that has a slate of movies, but uh, you know, it's very risky if you want to put movie, uh, your money into just one movie. It's, for those of you who are filmmakers that want to produce movies, I mean, for the sake of artistically, I, I can see that, but if you're doing it to make money, I think you should look elsewhere. It's, it's a tough business to make money in, um, especially if you're just looking at picture by picture. Um, and so this kind of shows you, in 2006, 60% of their market share came from Korean films. 2007, 45% came from Korean films, and it's been declining, meaning more people used to watch Korean films back in the day, in 2006, but nowadays more people are watching non-Korean films. Okay, so there's a problem. That means the production value it has been going down. Okay, it used to be that the Korean films are really great, and now it's not so much because they don't have enough money, first of all. And what's happening is because of that window that I talked about, you know, you you need. Uh, at least several weeks for a movie to play out, but, but especially these days when you only have the luxury of playing for three days only, and you have so many new other movies coming out, um, that you really need to recoup your costs within the first three days of open. And this is even more so in Korea where there are no DVD sales, there are no TV sales, because they're, most of them are downloading illegally, right? So they don't have that follow-up ancillary markets, and they have to make their money theatrically only, which means that they really cannot make their money back, right? Makes it very difficult. So what's happening is um, now they have a slew of movies that are really, really high budget, big action movies where they spend a lot of money, they spend a lot of money on top stars just so that they can get the, the people to come in and, and watch the movie. Or you have these that are very low budget, so even if you do lose money, you don't lose too much, right? So now you have like this big gap. You have huge blockbusters that still lose money, and then you have these really low independent budget movie, and you have nothing in between. So you have those movies that tend to be, let's say, Academy Award type of movies tend to be in that middle, and that is going away in Korea, which is a, a, a very sad phenomenon. But there is hope, I think. Um, the Korean wave is, is there, and it's still there. Um, it could still thrive. And the reason being why there's hope, because they love Korean movies. I know we, we're not Koreans here, but this topic is supposed to be Korean wave. Um, you guys should, if you have time, go watch some Korean films. I know we're business students here, but if you guys are interested in movies, it's very different, very edgy, very controversial, very interesting. Uh, you might want to go check some of these movies out. Like Old Boy is, is a classic that you might want to go rent. I think you can get it on Netflix. Can you get it on Netflix? You can, right? Okay. So you should watch that. Well, um, good news is this kind of shows you that Korean films in 2007 um, was only 30% of all the movies that were released. So let's say they released 100 movies, just for the sake of argument. 30 of them were Korean films. But really, 60% of all the revenue from theaters came from Korean movies, which means that only 30% of movies were Korean, but the money 60% of all the revenue came from Korean films, which means that Koreans still like Korean films, right? So there's still hope there. Uh, I, I think that they just need to up their production value and try to make a really good film as opposed to just try to make a lot of films. Um, and this is something that I want to tell, tell the Korean companies if they really want to make it out here, is that they need to make it investment friendly. And I don't, I mean, I don't mean to say anything negative, and I'm not, but I think there is room for improvement. 
meaning if we want to put money into Asia, if we want to co-produce, let's say, a film um, in Asia, and we put our money into it, and they put their money into it, well, we have to know where our money is going. Uh, oftentimes, it's not very transparent. Uh, contracts are almost non-existent in Asia. Uh, in, our, in Hollywood, if we hire a, an actor, if we cast an actor, the contract for the actor is like two, three hundred pages. It even tells you like detail, okay, he's going to get this brand of water five times a day, or he's not, you know, it, it gets very, very detailed. Whereas Korean contracts are like one pager. And I told my friend, he's like a Tom Cruise of Korea, and he said, Jeannie, can you take a look at my, my contract? It's like two pages. What do you mean it's two pages? Well, that's how we do it here. No, it should be two, three hundred pages. And he goes, no, well, two pages. And even this doesn't really hold. A lot of the times they break their contracts, they say, what, what are you going to do, sue me? Because in Korea, it's not a very litigious um, country. They don't sue as, well, as much. So they just say, well, sorry, maybe next time. Maybe I'll pay you later. You know? And they, they actually shoot before the, they get paid, which is unheard of, right? I mean, Brad Pitt's not going to come to set if we haven't paid him. He's not going to say, well, honor system. OK, I'm sure you guys will pay. It doesn't work that way. That's how it works in Asia still. So to really systemize and try to elevate the, the status of the movie industry, entertainment uh, industry as a whole in Asia, they really need to make things more systematic, right? Make it friendly. Um, I don't really want to talk about ethics. Um, so the right direction for this Korean wave to thrive and keep growing is, again, to have a really good system, okay? And not to have one person be the, the uh, uh, what, I, what I'm trying to say is that in Korea, the director is, is the boss. He pays everybody. He sets the schedule. I mean, he's, he's the boss. And we don't do that here. We, we allocate and we actually diversify our risk by having uh, lots of people do certain roles. Right? Uh, the way things are done in Asia is very different. I think that they should try to learn the Hollywood way. Not that Hollywood way is the best way, but it actually works. And I would like to urge people who are filmmakers, if you ever go to Asia and make films, I want you guys to really try to instill what you've learned here and try to elevate uh, the, the level of production and the way things are done. I think I'm running out of time. So the takeaway, this is my last slide, is that you really need to make things interactive, right? Just think about that. And metaverse, it's no longer a universe, it's really metaverse. You have to think about things the way, it, it, the synergy of different technologies and content, we always call it content convergence. You need to think about that, okay? It's a real thing. And um, the Korean wave can thrive, but really needs to kind of do a new business paradigm shift, if you will. Um, new media. Think online, new media. Just always try to stay one step ahead of your consumers and try to anticipate what they want and what they like five years from now. And that probably will make you a winner all around, not just in the movie industry, but whatever you do. Okay, try to stay one step ahead of everybody else. Um, I think that's it for me. The time is up. Okay, so if you guys have questions, come and talk to me. Please join us for our next lecture. For a complete schedule, visit our website at www.cba.lmu.edu/cab.